Today we are going to have this open day for the master degree in data science. As you know, this is a, a degree which is completely offered in English, so that's the reason why, even though uh, most of you are probably Italian, I will uh, uh, only speak English. Um, so the idea is that I first uh, uh, begin by giving a sort of uh, you know, institutional introduction to the program. I will give some general information about the program. And then uh, we have uh, three guests uh, that uh, will uh, uh, enter a little bit uh, into uh, some uh, details uh, and uh, will tell you something presumably much more interesting and fascinating with respect to what uh, I'm going to describe. But first, uh, I really would like uh, to give you an overview of what this program is. Uh, so this program uh, uh, started a couple of years ago uh, by the collaboration of five departments of this university and one uh, uh, research center or one foundation uh, that I will uh, tell you a little more about that uh, later. And uh, so it started like uh, a very big project. And uh, so what, what was the aim of uh, building uh, this uh, program in data science? So the aim uh, of course, is to build data scientists. But as you know, uh, in Italy and abroad, uh, there are now several different programs in data science, and, and they are really very different. So they have really different goal. They are, uh, you know, they really are aimed to attract different students. And uh, our ambition is uh, to build data scientists that have uh, all uh, these three uh, characteristics, these three uh, aspects. So they have a solid theoretical background, so in uh, math, computer science, and statistics. They have uh, very good uh, skills, uh, programming, computational. They know the different software which is available. So they know what are the main uh, computational tools and methodologies around. So you have a very good uh, applied uh, uh, preparation in that respect. And then uh, they have the possibility of focusing on some uh, specific application. So they have it, they, they try to, I mean, our aim is to develop for our student, to give our student the possibility of developing special skills and deep knowledge on specific applications. So, so of course, uh, not all possible applications of data science, because data science is a a huge amount of different possible and low relevant applications. And of course, uh, the application that we are offering as a, a possibility for enriching your curriculum are very much linked to what we know, to what uh, I mean, the, the, the professors in Padova know. So, uh, so this problem is, of course, built on what uh, is done in Padova. Uh, for what concerns research, first of all. So it's very much linked to the research that is given in Padova. So all research which is related to data science. So for example, computer science and engineering, here are some keywords, uh, artificial intelligence, security network, uh, human data analysis, statistics, so data mining, uh, economic data, social statistics, mathematics, of course, here we are in a math department. So some mathematics uh, is certainly present. Uh, in terms of stochastic models, uh, optimization, computational method. Then we have life science applications, so all application to biology and related topics, uh, in particular, you know, you see neuroscience and bioinformatics. And then cognitive science, application to cognitive science that are also very important. So we have uh, probably related to human computer interaction and cognitive neurosciences. So of course, uh, as you can read uh, from this slide, uh, uh, so very many, uh, uh, really broad, uh, uh, really, I mean, the, the, this, uh, this, uh, this application, these research uh, topics are very different, and that's the reason why to build this program we needed, uh, and we still need, uh, the collaboration of, uh, of five different departments. So let's go on and let's be a little more specific. So let's look at the program at, at a glance. So try to see how it is, uh, the courses of, of this program are organized. So the program is in three semesters. 
and uh, the courses are, so there is a part of the courses that I call the core courses, so the, co the courses that should give you the technical and theoretical preparation. So there are the courses related to computer science and engineering first, those related to mathematics, and uh, those related to statistics. So these are the three, uh, from the theoretical point of view, the three main uh, uh, fields that should build uh, uh, the theoretical basis for, for a computer scientist. And then uh, we have uh, applications. So we have uh, some spots for applications. So the spots are you know, the three spots that you see in yellow here. And then there are also the spots uh, that are occupied, that are uh, you know, related to the elective courses. So first of all, some of these applications, some of these applied courses are uh, you know, they have title here, so they are not elective, so they are for, uh, they have to be taken by all students. So there is a course uh, related to cognitive science, one uh, about uh, business economics, and one about uh, biological data, so biological application to data science. And then we have the elective courses, so the elective courses, so we have uh, four spots for elective courses, and uh, I mean, from, from what I can judge, uh, we have uh, a remarkable offer about uh, you know, these elective courses. So, so there is this table, of, uh, sitting around this table of data sciences, there are many, many applications. So AI, artificial intelligence, statistical methods, uh, big data for engineering, data science in biology. So we have an offer in that. Data in cognitive science, security and law, and also some more mathematical modeling. So this is just a, a visualization of the offers that we have for the elective courses. You will have to take uh, four of, uh, of this. And I mean, with those four, with those uh, four spots, I think we can build uh, a, a rather deep uh, knowledge about uh, at least one of these, of these, uh, of these applications. So these are the three semesters related to courses. And the fourth semester of the program is devoted to an internship, so to a stage. And uh, the stage is uh, the basis for the thesis. So the thesis is, uh, uh, has to be based uh, on, uh, on internship, on one or more internships. And, um, so uh, it's not written here. The internship uh, for the thesis uh, has to last at least uh, th three months. So essentially, it's a semester work. And then one has to write, write the thesis as uh, I mean, describing the work uh, done. And um, uh, this, uh, I mean, this internship is mandatory. So all students have to. Uh, have uh, the internship and the thesis, the thesis based on the internship. And uh, there will be a very many possibilities for the internships. Um, here I just uh, give uh, probably an non-exhaustive list of uh, private companies and uh, you know, university and research centers that uh, either are hosting some of uh, our students, or uh, with uh, I mean, with 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 this uh, with these companies of institution, we have uh, you know an agreement uh, that uh, they are uh, available to host uh, students, uh, our data science students. So you see, in the column of the private companies, uh, you see a lot of variety. There are consulting companies, there are uh, telecommunication companies, uh, uh, companies doing uh, finance. <laughs> application to finance, and uh, some of them uh, are in Italy, some of them are abroad. Uh, World Sensing is in Barcelona. Uh, Generali is, uh, is uh, um, the branch of Generali. We, we, are, we have uh, this agreement is in Paris, and, uh, and then, uh, let me see, I don't, maybe I do not remember, but at least one of the other was abroad. And you see that from the, in the column of the, of the research center, uh, they are, most of them are actually abroad. Um, these are center of very high reputation. 
And um, so this means that the thesis can be uh, based on, uh, you know, can, you, you can have very many different theses. So you can have a thesis uh, in, a, in a typical, you know, uh, environment of a private company, uh, maybe with the goal of getting a job, uh, maybe in that company or in that uh, specific field, so, but uh, also uh, a thesis uh, more uh, research oriented is also possible. Of course, uh, not only uh, this uh, institution do, do research, but also private companies do research. So we can, have, we can do research uh, both in the private or in the public sector. And, um, and uh, of course, I mean, the, the fact of having the possibilities of uh, a thesis uh, oriented uh, to research uh, uh, can also be important for those of you that maybe are interested in uh, continuing uh, their studies after the master degree, so to uh, enter a PhD program. So, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, this should uh, uh, this certainly also uh, give these possibilities. And uh, so, having said that, uh, you see in this uh, column of the University and in the Research Institute, uh, there is this uh, FBK. So, FBK appeared also in the first slide. It's actually one of our partners in the, in the, that has, uh, uh, you know, cooperated in building this master, master program. And uh, so, FBK stands for Fondazione Bruno Kressler. Is, uh, um, foundation that is uh, based in Trento and uh, manages a uh, certain number, I think about 10 uh, different research centers on uh, different topics uh, that covers math, computer science, uh, but also humanities. And uh, they, they host our students uh, for, 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 for stage, but they also collaborate in the sense that they send uh, their researcher in Padova and uh, to teach courses of uh, the data science uh, program. And they also have uh, helped us uh, to build a, a lab, uh, a lab which is actually dedicated to data science. So how about the admission? Uh, so. Uh, we have uh, so the number, the maximum number of admitted students uh, cannot uh, go over 40 for the European ones and uh, at most 10 uh, for the non-European. So the call uh, for the non-European uh, is already closed. Uh, typically the call uh, uh, is published in February or even before that. Um, while the call on admission for European students uh, is not yet open, it should open uh, very soon, uh, and uh, it will stay open until at least until the end of August. Last year, it was open until the 2nd of September. So this is uh, I mean, the, 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 the period of time in which, uh, you, if you wish, uh, you, you should apply. And uh, one important thing about uh, this master that uh, I think is somewhat uh, atypical for the Italian university system is that this master actually welcomes students with different background. And I say that and I mean that. It is that we do have students with different backgrounds. We have students uh, with, uh, with a laurea in, or, or a bachelor in statistics, computer science, engineering, mathematics, physics, biology. We do not have yet uh, anybody that really has a degree in economics, but it was only by chance. I mean, there is no reasons why somebody with a degree in economics uh, cannot enter the program. We have uh, two students uh, coming from psychology. So uh, it's, um, of course, I mean, to enter the program, you need uh, to have uh, a minimum background in math and computer science. And, um, you know, most of these programs uh, give uh, this background uh, to all students. Uh, some of them do not. So in that case, uh, students have to manage to, to take uh, you know, your, uh, your, your elective courses uh, in, the, in the bachelor, in the laurea triennale, in such a way to, I mean, to satisfy the requirement for admission to data science. But this is uh, possible also for students uh, coming uh, from uh, 
you know, from, from degrees that uh, do not belong uh, to the realm of uh, hard sciences. And the selection is based on student curriculum, so there is no interview, it's uh, only, it, uh, it is uh, based on, um, on your curriculum, so on the, on the grades, on the exams, uh, and uh, in other aspects, if you have uh, other experiences, uh, non-academic, they also can be valued uh, for, for the admission. Um, okay, if you want more information, you can visit uh, the web page of uh, the program. You can contact me, my name is Paolo De Pra. Angela Puca is the secretary of, uh, of, the, of the master, so if you have a question uh, concerning uh, uh, rules of admission, uh, you know, sort of administrative uh, questions, uh, you can also refer to Angela. Okay, so that's, uh, I think I have talked uh, even too much, and uh, now it's time, uh, you know, to enter a little bit, uh, uh, I mean, to, to go to the heart of, of data science. And so uh, the first speaker is going to be uh, Mauro Conti, which is a professor in this department, Department of Mathematics. And uh, so I... Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, again, so I'm, I'm going to give, uh, I mean, a very specific view on the data science, which is coming from my uh, research interest, of course. Uh, as you see, uh, the name of my research group is Spritz, which needs no introduction here, I guess. But uh, I also have a justification for this acronym. I think you don't care about the justification. Uh, so I'm going to tell you, uh, I mean, a couple of minutes what we do uh, as a research group and then focus on something which might be a bit more related to the uh, science of data. As you can imagine, we as uh, users, we produce a lot of data. So uh, the link between, between the, the data science and the security is very strong because of course data can tell a lot about uh, what users do uh, and so on. So I have a lot of slides, but I'm going to skip, like for example, the justification of the splits. I know you, you don't need that. Uh, as a research group, we have a lot of international collaborations with uh, institution, national and international institution that uh, somehow care about the security of, of uh, people and uh, companies like the one you see uh, in the slides. And of course, I mean, if there is, uh, there are opportunities for uh, internship and uh, uh, doing your thesis also in these uh, companies. These are just some of the reasons we ended up in the news, up to now only for good uh, reason. Uh, uh, these are some of the prizes uh, students in our group got, and uh, one of the things we are more proud of is uh, last year our research group uh, won a national uh, cyber challenge. So there was a team trained uh, at the University of Padua that, that got the first prize uh, in Italy. Uh, I'm also involved in some activity in the blockchain with the research project, and I'm also a member of a national team at the uh, Italian government designing the strategy for the blockchain. And by the way, the blockchain is definitely another source of data uh, uh, that can be of interest for you. Uh, a couple of things I want to, uh, to add. One is uh, why it is important uh, to study cybersecurity. Of course, one reason uh, could be that you might get uh, very well paid. There is a very strong shortage of uh, people skilled in cybersecurity. I don't know whether you can read this uh, report. Here is basically a survey uh, that has been done among uh, uh, chief information officer of companies. Actually, the first one is the skills about big data. So you are definitely in the, in the right place. And uh, analytics of data and so on. Uh, but among the top, more uh, required skills in the futures, there is uh, uh, security and resiliency skills, which as you will see in the next part of my talk, there is actually a strong link between data science and security. And also, I mean, as you can see, I mean, from different surveys, there will be, uh, again, a, a strong shortage of people skilled in cybersecurity, like 3.5 million people needed with skills in cybersecurity that they are not there around now. So as a research group, we, we work in several areas. Uh, some of them might be less linked to, to the data science, 
So in general, these are the, uh, the area we work on for, so mostly on uh, mobile security, future internet architectures, protocols, network protocols, uh, social network, internet of things, cyber physical system, and so on. But the topic I'm going to spend, uh, I mean, some minutes uh, now is the one of uh, side and cover channel, just to make some examples of how, uh, I mean, data can uh, leak, either tell a lot of about the people that generate or, or machines that generate this data, or also the information that this, uh, this data can leak about a system. Okay, so this might be a scenario. You have a computer which is locked. So likely I'm not using Windows, but if this was my really real uh, login screen, I might just input my password here. So you might ask, okay, what's wrong with this? As I will show later, this might already be a source of information. So the, the, what I'm going to talk about is what we call side and cover channel, okay? Side channel means that basically you try to make sense of information where apparently there is nothing to, to worry about or, or there is no real information. So if this is my real uh, login and I input my password here, in principle, you should not be able to know anything about my password. The truth is you, learn, you might learn something about my password. Okay, that's just a, a premise. So what I'm going to talk is maybe tell you what I mean by side and cover channel. Again, not everybody is coming from a uh, maybe computer science background or engineering background, communication background. So I will try to make that clear. And then I will try to give you just a few uh, very simple, short example. Actually, all things I'm going to mention here are actual uh, research results. So our results of, uh, of the research of our group <clears throat> that we prove the, or build uh, some side and cover channel. Uh, I will try to make it extremely light. So I will just tell you what are the outcomes of, this, uh, of these results. So first of all, what is a side and a cover channel? So at a very high level, if you care about the security of a, of a system, let's say your computer or your smartphone, usually you have uh, some security mechanism to protect the device, like the login, for example. And usually you have some security mechanism to, uh, to secure the communications, right? So you go on Facebook with your phone. There is a specific protocol that make the communication secure, okay? Which, is, which means authenticated, confidential, so it must be encrypted and so on. So that's the ideal world. Uh, in real life, what happens is that uh, uh, the adversary shouldn't be able to get anything. I mean, there are a lot of work already done in the past decades for securing systems and, and, uh, and communications. But the, the truth is that whatever you do in, in the real life has a side effect, okay? So when uh, you use a machine or you communicate through a network channel, there is something which even physically cannot be avoided, okay? For example, I mean, this machine is consuming energy. If you type on your keyboard, you do with a given timing. If I was to enter my password in that login, you could see the time. Actually, you can even record the time with cameras and you can access with all your comfort and tools in the lab to, to analyze the video, the draw, okay? Or another thing that we are going to see in this talk, if, if I type on my keyboard, you hear the noise, right? That's a side effect. So what is a side channel? A channel, I mean, in, in, a, in an abstract way, a channel of communication is a means by which we communicate some information, right? So there is a channel, there are two peers, they use this channel to exchange some message. A side channel is a communication channel which is a side effect. It means it was not intended to be there, but if you are able to read from that channel, there is some communication for you, okay? So this is the concept of side channel. A slightly different concept is the one of covert channel. Covert channel means that uh, two peers want to talk to each other, 
in a way which is not, uh, let's say, visible. Okay? A typical example which is done in the security course is an example of two prisoners. You imagine like, there are two prisons with two poor guys in the, in the jail. And there is a guard in the middle that can pass message from one to another, okay? So of course the guard will inspect the message and eventually bring the message to the other prisoner, okay? Of course if, if they agree on a plan to kill the guard, the guard will never pass the message on, right? But if they pre-agree on a way to hide the communication, they will say, okay, look, I will write you a letter but don't read the letter, only read the first character of each line. So even if the guard takes the message and inspect, the message might be, oh, this guard is so nice, why we don't bring a present for him, and so on. But if you read the, only the first character, the actual message will be, oh, the next guard, time the guard approach you, you hold it, I will come and hit and we kill him. Okay, which is not exactly the same thing. So again, in real, in real life, there might be a way to build cover channels. So to build communication channels which are exploited, for example, for a malicious purpose. Okay? Okay, what I'm going to do now, just mention a few examples of side and cover channels that we either identified or built in practical communication system that I'm sure all of you uh, use daily. Okay, the first one is, uh, is basically based on the network traffic. I'm sure all of you have at least one smartphone. Now your smartphone is uh, connected uh, possibly to the Wi-Fi access point, EduRoam. In such cases, uh, even in the best uh, scenario, let's say best scenario means that your phone is not compromised and uh, you have no vulnerable application, so everything is state-of-the-art secure, okay? Even in that scenario, I'm sorry for you, but the communication is inherently wireless. You see no wires going on from, going out from our mobile phone. So communication is wireless. Being wireless is, is broadcast. It means everybody can eavesdrop, okay? So I might have an, uh, an antenna eavesdropping the traffic of everybody. So our question at this point was, this, basically, so we, we just try to look at this channel. This is encrypted, so we, we don't make sense out of the content of the packets, but we can see something going on, okay? We don't need to go into the, like, computer science detail of the protocols, TCP, IPA, but you can imagine that there are some communication exchanged here, okay? So if somebody is in the middle, like in this case, I can just take a look at all the messages. If the messages are properly encrypted, I cannot open. So if somebody is sending a WhatsApp message to some, somebody else, I cannot open the message. But I can see some traffic pattern, right? The, the traffic pattern will be from you to some server, from the server to somebody, of, uh, somebody else of you, and so on. So what we try to do, basically, is to look at the visible information. So even if things are encrypted, you can still see that the packet has a given length, is coming at a given time, and so on. So what we try to do, uh, basically, is looking at the network traffic and trying to profile each single action that the user can do on a mobile device. And we applied machine learning, which is, for those that don't know, is one of the great tools that we have nowadays to analyze data and make sense out of data. So what we do, basically, we do this type of, uh, of profiling. And we are able to infer from the encrypted network traffic, so there is no actual attack, okay? We are not compromising your device. We are not uh, exploiting any vulnerabilities. We'll just look at the traffic, and we are able to tell exactly what is the action that the user is doing on the mobile device. First of all, we can tell the set of applications that the user has installed on the mobile device. And you can imagine, with the help of psychologists, how nice profile they can give about a person if you give the set of apps. Definitely they can tell you sex, language spoken, interest, age range, and so on. Plus, they, we can tell with this technology exactly what the user is doing. So if somebody of you now is, uh, is doing a very specific, uh, specific action on an app, 
very specific action, I mean, for example, if you're using Facebook and tagging somebody on Facebook, I can tell, okay, that phone now tagged somebody on Facebook. And you can imagine, for example, if you were in the Arab Spring where they used the anonymous profile to call for revolution, if the government and telco operator at that point was having this technology, you can imagine that it would have been possible to de-anonymize the, this anonymous profile. And again, long story short, without going into details, uh, these are the results. Uh, the F measure is basically how good are the performances of this type of attack. And uh, basically the message is we have almost no error. So if, if this technology tells, okay, that guy received a WhatsApp message, it means he received a WhatsApp message. And even in this room, if somebody is now chatting on WhatsApp, and if you see a pattern going on, somebody sending a message, somebody receiving, and so on, then probably you can at least link that these two people are communicating, right? It is not a violation of uh, content. So it's not a matter of content privacy. We are not able to see the content of the message, but we are able to see that two people are communicating with each other, which is already a contextual privacy violation. Okay, this is one of the things. So basically the idea here was to, again, I'm going fast. The idea here was to exploit network traffic from a physical point of view. So we don't, we don't, we don't go into the, I mean, uh, computer scientist details or hacker attacks of packets. We just look at, at packets communication going on, and out of that, we make sense of what are the actions that the user is doing on a mobile device. On a similar, uh, uh, on a, a similar approach, we used for uh, energy consumption. So in this case, what we have done is two things. One, we use the energy consumption as a side channel. Second, we use the energy consumption as a cover channel. As a side channel, what we have done is uh, we've shown that it is possible if you have the uh, consumption at the wall socket, now you know that it is all, all the smart buildings, smart here, smart there, everything is smart but humans. Uh, so you can control, I mean, very likely in the new building you can control the energy consumption at each wall socket. Okay, our question was, okay, if somebody has access to this information, our specific question was, is that person able to tell exactly who is plugged on that socket? And the answer is yes. Again, in short, uh, again, this is the scenario. I mean, everything is smart. We use this uh, device, which is actually not even, I mean, it's a very old device, it gives a, uh, frequency, uh, I mean, give information every second about the energy consumption, it's very raw. But again, basically, the message is that we are able to profile a person with his own laptop. So if Professor Daipra now comes with his own laptop and plug here, if it has been profiled before, just knowing the energy consumption of the socket, I can tell, yes, this is him, okay? So this is, a si this is an example of a side channel. So that communication was not intended to be there. So you, you just plug the socket. You don't intend to communicate that you are plugged there. But by the way you consume the energy, you do. A more interesting scenario is basically this. Uh, I'm not asking how many of you have a smartphone, and maybe I'm not also asking how many of you have a power bank. If you don't have a power bank, I'm sure you charge your phone somehow in the car, in the plane, at home, okay? So if I ask you, OK, what is inside a power bank? The trivial answer would be a battery. What else? Only a battery? Our question was, OK, what else can be there? And what, what can be done if, you, if there is something else? OK? Again, this is a matter of analyzing uh, data. And basically, what we are able to do is that uh, we build, uh, I mean, with some components, we, we build an attack that can steal information from the phone, only looking at the energy consumption of the device. Okay? I have a video, if there is time, maybe at the end I will also show this video, but otherwise I have another video demo. But uh, really, basically, we implemented this in an Arduino Mini. Uh, board for those that know. Basically, these things can really be inside a power bank. Okay? We have a prototype, a working prototype, 
and we are able to steal information. So the scenario is you go to the airport, you plug, and by the energy consumption pattern of your phone, somebody is stealing information, pictures, contacts, whatever is in your phone. Uh, okay, this I'm only going to mention, device movement. This is also another kind of uh, side, uh, side channel where you can steal information. The scenario is basically you type password here, okay? When you type password, I mean, you might not notice, but you move the device, okay, right? Okay, good. By this movement, we are able to infer what kind of password you are typing, if it is a password or any other message. So if you install an app that only asks a permission to uh, movement sensors, you may say, okay, this app would not know anything about my writing. No, it will do or it might do, okay? And uh, maybe something, uh, okay, not to make it too, say, public or too clear, but even something which is strongly related and maybe overlapping with uh, machine learning, there are a lot of uh, interesting things about uh, adversarial use of machine learning. I might have a slide here, maybe. Uh, so basically, as you know, again, machine learning is a great tool that is going to be used uh, almost everywhere now from autonomous car to the medical sector, and people is using that as a black box. But you know, as, as computer science and machine learning is becoming everyday life component, if those components are not secure, something might go wrong. And if there is a reason for somebody to gain if something goes wrong, something will go wrong, okay? So what I want to say here is that there are scenarios where in the use of machine learning, there might be vulnerabilities. One of those scenarios might be where there are applications of uh, so-called federated machine learning. Federated machine learning means that this machine learning technology is used uh, in a distributed ways on, uh, on, for example, on some devices. Might be, I don't know, some big companies using, doing this on my phone, on each uh, person's phone, and then collecting not, not the private information, but the outcome. And then deciding how people type, how they might help, for example, people to type in a better way and send back information. We are looking, for example, at this uh, transit of information related to the machine learning to see whether the, there might be some leak of information behind this. Okay, without going into details, a couple of other topics I would like to mention before closing is, one is again the keystroke timing. Uh, this is a, basically a very, I mean, for now it's quite old uh, known uh, technology to authenticate people. So if you type on a keyboard, it, it's a matter of, I don't know, you type 50 different characters are enough to authenticate a very specific person with a very small error. And the keystroke analysis is basically based on, uh, on the timing, right? When you type, there is a given time from one key press to the next key press, okay? And actually there are, I mean, there are a lot of possible measures you can take. And uh, again, what is possible to do here is possible to authenticate uh, people. And the joke I started with at the beginning about the login screen is something where timing is there, right? So if I type my password in my login, or any professor's lecture you attend where the professor typed the password at the beginning and maybe you, you also have the, the video recorded with this. You can, uh, you can basically uh, make sense out of this. I don't know if I have uh, the slide I want. Uh, yeah, basically this, this is sen the scenario, right? And actually a similar scenario is this. If, if you have, if you are in a queue for taking money for, from the ATM, uh, you might be in queue. Of course, you don't. You, you, I mean, you cannot spy on what person is is typing. Because to spy means you really need to be here, right, and see what is pressing. So if you see what is typing, then okay, you have the pin. But if you just kindly are be, below the yellow line, which is typically there, so the comfort zone for the user. Still, you can look at the screen, and if you uh, record a video of what the user is typing, of course you see just asterisk or just some symbols which is hiding the, the character, but you see the timing, okay? 
So again, applying uh, machine learning techniques from this timing, we are able to infer with some error, but there are some pin numbers which are very unlucky. We can infer basically the pin numbers, again, with some error. Uh, last thing I would like to, to mention as a side effect is this. Again, acoustic emanation is a, is a side effect of uh, almost everything, every activity we do. And here the scenario is the one of, uh, of uh, people having a Skype call. Uh, so the scenario is this, basically, Let's say companies have a, are having a Skype call to come to, a, to, to close an agreement, a deal, uh, buying, selling something, or lawyers might be negotiating something, merchant acquisition of companies, big important things. During this uh, conf call, somebody types on the keyboard. Okay? Actually, this, to be honest, this uh, research work started as a joke because during another research work, we were in a conf call on Skype, and somebody was typing. And then, then we started joking, say, oh, look, stop typing. We know you're, I mean, you're not taking notes. You are just maybe browsing Facebook, something. Please pay attention. Then, then it started a joke. And then we asked ourselves, can we maybe infer what a person is typing only knowing the noise which is transmitted over Skype? That, by the way, use a lot of encryption, noise cancellation, blah, 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 right? Okay, the answer is yes. Actually, I mean, with, without going into details and without being too long in my talk, maybe I will now use the demo video. So what happened is that we, we did this uh, research. We, 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 we come up to, I mean, with a research scientific result claiming that, okay, yes, we are able to, with, again, with some error, but we are able to tell what the user is typing from the noise which is transmitted through a Skype call. And we published this, uh, this scientific work. I mean, some weeks after, I got a call from a journalist from Forbes. He told me, oh, Professor, I've seen this paper of you. You published this, very nice, interesting. I would like to have an interview with you. Okay, so we, we scheduled the appointment for the interview. And before closing the, the call, this guy told me, okay, look, ah, by the way, you know, tomorrow when I call, I will type on my keyboard and I want you to tell me what I'm typing. And then I say it, okay, I don't say, I, I cannot say the proper word I say it, because uh, it's video recorded, but I say, oh, 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 I must be careful, okay? Because, I mean, if, if, if this doesn't work with the journalist, he would say, okay, these guys in Padua do fake stuff. So after, the, after, after I closed the, the phone call, I told my, uh, the group of students involved in this work, please, I mean, Try to understand, use the open source intelligence to understand which kind of machine this guy has. Because if we know the specific machine, machine I mean brand and model of the, of the journalist in this case, which is the victim in general, then we can use our training phase of the machine learning on that specific model. And then performances might be a bit higher. Likely this guy was a fan of uh, Apple and he has a Twitter profile with pictures. Okay, done. So we know which kind of machine has. So we, we did a training on that machine. And again, maybe it's uh, better to show you the video. Yeah. Well, 
So as you can imagine, in any practical life see and attack also, there are a lot of knowledges that you can merge, right? So in this specific attack, of course, there are a lot of natural language processing techniques that you can use, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. And uh, the last thing, because, I mean, once we get uh, all these uh, working green, we close the journalist loop. Now we know the book, yeah, yeah. we can just Google so this word and we get all the stuff. <laughs> Okay, the second, the second challenge was a bit more difficult, was the scenario of a password, so it's just single word, actually even not so common English word, I would say, which was embraced and we got it, then the journalists become very, very tough, if we put up, put up loud music on the phone, I don't know whether you can hear the music, but there was loud music, in that case it doesn't work. So that, for example, might be a good countermeasure, but of course, I also would like to see lawyers negotiating uh, an agreement uh, with loud music in the background. It might not work. One of the two. The attack doesn't work, but maybe not even the negotiation. Okay, again, as you can see in these scenarios, I mean, uh, I mean this was just a joke, but uh, there are a lot of uh, scenarios where people type something during a Skype call, and might also be people in the same office, and when you type, there might be anything, might be an email which is confidential, might be notes, might be a message you send to somebody else in the conf call to say, okay, this company, people are stupid, let's uh, ask a discount or something. Or there might be private information like the scenario of a password. During a conf call, you might log in in, uh, in Google, for example. Oh, let's do a shared Google Doc. So there might be a lot of scenarios because uh, of which this might be a threat. Okay, actually with this, I also try to close my presentation. Okay, so we proceed uh, to the next talk, uh, for which we have two guests. Michele Steindler works uh, for Generali in Paris, and uh, so we had concert with him, and uh, uh, through him, uh, uh, we could uh, place uh, one of our students, uh, Yari Lazzaro, uh, in stage uh, in Generali, and this was uh, very, very nice. We were very happy about that. And so, you're going to know everything about uh, <laughs> Generali and application of data science in that context. So, uh, my name is uh, Michele Steindler, and uh, I am an ex-student of this uh, university, so I'm very happy to, to be here and invited by Paolo. And uh, now I uh, manage the um, AI Competence Center in uh, uh, Generali France. So, uh, for the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, we'll try to um, uh, talk a little bit on what we are doing in the Competence Center and uh, with uh, a uh, practical example on, uh, uh, on a, a research topic we are uh, developing with uh, Yari and with the help of uh, the data science uh, department. Uh, we'll try to have a question and answer in the end, but uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me if you have any, any question during the presentation. So uh, first, uh, you may uh, ask to yourself why uh, an insurance company want to use uh, artificial intelligence. Actually, uh, very, a very, very uh, important competition now uh, between uh, a financial institution. And uh, um, we have really the goal to improve uh, as much as possible the um, services that we provide to, to our uh, customers. And uh, also to uh, decrease the cost of our internal operation. Uh, in this perspective, uh, uh, Generali France uh, launched a, a very uh, challenging program. It's called Excellence 2022. Um, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence is uh, really a cornerstone of this uh, uh, program, uh, mainly on four areas. Um, so it's, of course, developing the business to, so to get more uh, customer, um, to improve uh, the um, interface with customer, uh, via digitalization, I will show you some examples. 
very important uh, the uh, uh, analysis of data, of uh, unstructured data, because uh, in an uh, insurance company you have uh, enormous quantity of text uh, and images, but uh, until now they are not uh, really analyzed. And very, very important, the streamlining automation of uh, uh, the uh, internal processes. Uh, so now, uh, on these four topics, um, due to these four topics, uh, AI is really becoming central in uh, uh, the IT uh, scenario of uh, Generali in connection with RPA, so the robotic process uh, automation that is uh, um, a, a pure execution of uh, uh, simple tasks. Um, a little bit of history. So we started, uh, we are quite young because we started at the beginning of 2017. Uh, we uh, performed a so-called uh, cognitive assessment. That, um, so it, it was the analysis of the possibility to implement uh, artificial intelligence uh, within uh, the uh, generali processes. Uh, we were supported at the time by IBM, and uh, we found out many, many possibilities. So, so uh, we isolated frame, uh, 30 uh, main uh, options, and we concentrated on three pilots. Uh, the three pilots were uh, a chatbot uh, to um, interact, to help agents, generally agents. A second uh, pilot was uh, a, um, a tool uh, to analyze data on a specific uh, um, legal requirement, uh, French legal requirement, uh, which is called the dormant contract. Uh, if you want, I can explain, but it's not very interesting. Uh, the, the third, uh, and maybe the main use case that we implemented in 2017 was an email analyzer. So we were able to uh, detect the intention of an email and extract uh, characteristics such as uh, the sender, the, the, the contract number, and other. Um, so uh, in 2017, we presented, uh, middle 2017, we presented this result to the uh, general management that decided to, um, to build a specific structure that is the competence center that I'm leading. Um, in the end, 2018, so we had a very strong ramp up because we started from zero to 30 people. Now uh, we are um, around 30 people. And in 2019, I don't have it in the slide, we had been assigned by the overall group uh, as leader for the artificial uh, intelligence uh, strategy. Um, a little um, explica uh, explanation on the roles that we have uh, in the competence center. So, of course, uh, uh, we have a huge, huge technical component, and uh, we have not only uh, data scientists, uh, data engineers, but also uh, full stack uh, developers. So we, um, we are autonomous in the development end to end of our uh, system. Uh, so not only the algorithm, but also the back end and the uh, front end. We have architects to, uh, um, uh, to fit the system into the complex scenario of an IT of a, a big uh, company like Generali. We have project managers uh, and Scrum Master. It's important to mention that uh, our project are um, full agile in Scrum. Uh, last but not least, uh, thesis and uh, internship. So for us, it's very important uh, to, um, to have in our team uh, thesis student and internship uh, in order to get uh, new ideas and to, uh, to evaluate the talents. So what are the projects we, uh, we implemented and we are working on? So first, uh, our uh, customer. So we are not working only for the traditional uh, customer on insurance, so the, a guy that wants to, to buy an insurance uh, contract, but also for internal clients that are employees, brokers, agents, and uh, overall operations. So for example, uh, human resources, uh, purchase department, legal department. So, um, and uh, we serve all these customers, and which are the uh, kind of technology. So on this side, we, uh, we want to try as much as possible to uh, implement an open 
um, ecosystem, as we call. So we want uh, uh, just to use the, uh, uh, the best technology for, for the right use case. So we are not... Uh, um, so we are not a research center, so we are um, trying to, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So when we need to implement something, we check on the market what is existing, and then we develop if it is not uh, existing. This is a little bit, and, or if it is not cost effective to, to buy, to purchase from the market. Um, in this perspective, we have a lot of different technologies uh, in, uh, already within our, our uh, IT scenarios like uh, um, uh, uh, Google, uh, IBM, uh, Microsoft, uh, um, uh, Node4j uh, uh, and other, um, but uh, I can, I can uh, list for you if you are interested. Uh, going to the project, so um, I tried to put them in categories. So a category where we had a lot of effort, especially at the beginning, was a chatbot. Uh, so a chatbot is a good way to um, uh, streamline the interaction with the external and internal uh, customer. Uh, I think that all of you are uh, aware of what it is a chatbot. It's a, way, it's a, it's a system that uh, understands the, the intention on, of the user and then uh, try to give an answer or to perform a task. Uh, so example, example of this uh, are um, a chatbot that we implemented on generali.fr website for, for client and customer uh, to uh, help them to find the good product or to have a quotation or to uh, perform uh, operation on their account. Um, we have also internal chatbot. An example can be the uh, chatbot on IT help desk. So it is a, a system uh, that help uh, generally employees uh, to perform quickly um, simple uh, operation, self-service operation on uh, on IT perspective. For example, to um, uh, to reset their password. So they can instead of uh, calling the desk, asking to open a ticket. Uh, we just can uh, uh, open Skype, and on Skype we can uh, connect to the, the chatbot and ask uh, about the operation. Um, I want to mention also a third chatbot. We have, we have really many now in production. Um, but it's a, a, about a general strategy. So um, the group, so we, we are uh, representing 60 different countries, ask us to implement a chatbot that could cover uh, all the countries in order to um, spread information from the central communication department that is in Milan uh, to uh, all the countries. And uh, uh, this is becoming now a, 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 a very important communication platform for Generali. And the first use case on this platform is the strategy, the new strategy. So you can, if you are an, a, a general employee, you can just uh, chat uh, with this uh, uh, chatbot asking what uh, is, uh, for example, the strategy for uh, innovation in uh, Ireland. And, and you can get information, video, or documents. But we don't do only uh, chat. We uh, concentrate quite a lot now on voice. So technologies are quite uh, similar because uh, we are um, always uh, basing on, uh, on platform like uh, Watson or uh, uh, Lewis and Microsoft. Uh, but then we, um, we add a layer on uh, uh, voice uh, text to, to speech and uh, speech to text. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we implemented this kind of system in our help uh, desk um, to, um, uh, to have a uh, 24 by 7 answer uh, to customer that are calling uh, and also in that case to perform behind some uh, si simple um, task, for example, to ask for a certification. Now can be done. Uh, asking by the telephone, and uh, behind there is a, a robot, an RPA system that um, provide and send an email to the customer with the, the information that has been uh, requested. Uh, we work also uh, with the Google Home and Alexa, so uh, these connected devices. Now in France, uh, uh, nearly everyone has at home uh, this kind of device, so it's, uh, it will be probably something very interesting to reach uh, the customer and uh, to um, simplify uh, the, the, the contact with the, the company. 
And now coming to uh, another category, uh, the text uh, analyzer. So uh, in general, we receive around 3 million email per year and uh, around 6 million um, paper mail per year. So to um, uh, dispatch, just dispatch this email, we have a team of 100 people. So people that are just looking at the text on email and they are uh, sending it to, to the right department. So um, last year we, we started to develop a system that is uh, have really working with very good performance to, um, uh, to uh, analyze uh, the, these uh, emails and uh, um, get the intention and extract the, the correct entities then to, uh, to send to the correct department and create what we call a work package um, ready to be treated. Um, so this is a very, very uh, important project in the perspective to have people doing more value-added um, tasks in the companies. Um, I, I, there are another category where it is more um, graph related, so we work quite a lot with graph. Um, and uh, I want to mention the fraud. So uh, in, uh, in the insurance business, uh, we, uh, we know that one out of 10 claim is a fraudulent claim. So it's an enormous amount of money. So um, when you are able to analyze uh, complex fraud, this is really beneficial. So here we, we, have a, uh, we develop a system based on graph that is uh, uh, matching external and internal data in order to find a specific uh, path. Last uh, um, uh, group of project is uh, the, the analysis of the text and images. Um, uh, we, we, have the, we are in two areas. One is uh, on for HR, uh, human resources. We developed a system that is able to match a CV uh, with uh, a, um, a request from HR. So um, you can have a ranking of, uh, of the CV, a pre-filtering. Pre um, and the second use case is uh, about visa recognition. Visa recognition uh, is something that uh, also Yari is, is, uh, is working now, and we can uh, apply it on many, many different uh, uh, scenarios. The one that we are trying to work with is uh, uh, to, from a photo uh, to be able to uh, extract a risk. So for example, if you have a, a photo of a, a castle uh, with a, a tree that is uh, just uh, falling on the, the, the castle, or then you can have some information and uh, you, uh, you can have some evaluation to, uh, to calculate the risk. So um, now I'll just to word to uh, introduce what uh, Yari is working on. So uh, there is a specific uh, process that uh, is called a continuous improvement process that is one of the most important for the uh, AI Competence Center. That is uh, the process that starts as soon as a project is into production. The continuous improvement means that uh, we, um, from the day zero, we start to improve the performance of the system by injecting data and uh, retraining the, the different models. Uh, the, the one that I'm showing here is uh, uh, related to uh, a chatbot. The chatbot that we, uh, is called Leo, it's a public chatbot. If you type generali.fr, you will see on, the, um, on, on, on your screen. Um, uh, the uh, important to mention that this is a very, very manual um, process. To, so to have a good chatbot, a chatbot that will really answer to your question, uh, need a very, very important manual uh, processing. So uh, this is uh, one of the major uh, pain points for us, and uh, it is where uh, now uh, Yari is, uh, is helping on, uh, on a work, a specific work on uh, NLP, uh, this NLP area. Okay, thanks Michele, and hi everyone. I'm Yari, currently a student of the master's degree in data science. I'm doing an internship with Generali France in the Center of Competence for Artificial Intelligence. I just wanted to wrap up very quickly on the problems of the current approach and the limitations regarding the implementation and, uh, um, and curation of the, uh, of the chatbots, which is the project I'm currently working on. 
As you may have guessed, uh, uh, and as Michele was introducing, uh, the process is very time consuming, very labor intensive, and I think there are like eight, nine people in the team that are like uh, every day full time working on this uh, process of continuous improvement. So, um, and they also require, of course, to interact with people from other teams, uh, from professionals, in order to understand which are the new questions to implement and the answers to implement. So, it's really tedious and uh, it's impossible to scale uh, and very expensive. So, the natural solution to this kind of problem is uh, a chatbot, which uh, ideally would be fully autonomous and requires minimal uh, overhead of work from uh, um, an employee. So, we were lucky enough that uh, on uh, November of last year, Google released this uh, incredible model, it's BERT, which was able to achieve state-of-the-art accuracy for 11 natural language processing tasks. And among these, there are like sentiment analysis, text summarization, and as well uh, uh, question answering, which is what we are actually interested in the context of, uh, um, of chatbots. And, uh, What's fascinating about this uh, is that uh, they were able to develop this model which is uh, extremely flexible and just by fine tuning the final layers uh, of this model, so it means in a couple of hours of training of the model, you are able to like fine tune uh, this model to the specific task you are targeting. So in our case, it's question answering and uh, the the accuracy they were able to achieve with the, uh, their biggest English model was uh, in terms of F1 score, 93.2, which is a less biased way to indicate the accuracy of the model. And uh, what's interesting is it outperforms the human accuracy by two points. So it, it's really a promising approach uh, to, um, to, to substitute uh, or to uh, complement the current approach they're following for the chatbots. Um, we have a demo before moving to this. Uh, the, um, so the, the project is currently a pilot project which will be used for internal employees which uh, uh, are looking for answers to questions related to complicated insurance documents. So we have this input data which are uh, PDF documents, PDF insurance contracts, and the employees would like to find answers to these contracts. The demo is of course a very um, limited environment, very simple example, but should give the idea. Okay, so we here um, we extracted two pieces of contents. One is the privacy policy of Google, and the other one is the Wikipedia page of Batman, which we will use for for this demo. And uh, here is basically the Wikipedia page uh, uh, stripped down uh, from all the uh, like HTML overhead, and. Uh, so of course the model has its own limitations. We're gonna try um, in a couple of questions. Uh, we know that the answer is within this text uh, and this is one of the limitations I will speak about to you later. And like, uh, um, when, was, uh, when was the first uh, story of Batman published? Uh, ideally, we would like to run this kind of model on a GPU-based uh, uh, laptop, which is not the case in this situation. So the model will take a bit to find the answer, but it extracted the, like, the correct answer and we are highlighting the context uh, around the question. If we would ask, like, where was it published, it will highlight uh, this. And, uh, I mean, again, the model is quite simplistic in this scenario, but it's very powerful if you think to uh, if you think of all the work that really is done by, by the other members of the team uh, to manually implement all these intents and this question, uh, being able to implement such technology would, be really, uh, would, would really be a game changer. And uh, for those of you who don't remember what is the secret identity of Batman, And uh, in a moment, we'll see like what's going on behind the scenes here. And um, okay, so Bruce Wayne. Um, let's see, so what's going on here basically, um, to birth to our model, we need to, to provide him a context where ideally we should know that the answer lies within this context. Of course, he will answer with a, an answer uh, associated to an accuracy. 
And uh, so basically within this, this text, uh, we would like to extract uh, the paragraphs which are more likely to contain the answer. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, what's going on behind the scenes in a, in a way. So here is an extract of some of the paragraphs uh, and with some normalization applied, so what's called uh, stemming. So we are extracting just the roots of each word uh, in order that, for example, singular and plural forms will just merge to the same word. So words with similar meaning will merge to the, to the same words. At this point, uh, we want to convert this kind of representation to a vector representation, which of course you won't see here because it's, uh, everything is black, but okay, maybe you, you will see some red dots here and there. So this is basically a vector representation where we have a matrix of 123 rows. Each of these is a paragraph. And uh, on the columns, uh, there is a, a dictionary composed of all the words uh, in the corpus that you saw before. And uh, the, the matrix represents only the, uh, the word frequency, so the word count of, uh, um, of every word for every paragraph. And this is actually not very interesting in our case because, for example, there might be words which are very frequent over all the paragraphs, and so they are not really uh, they don't have discriminative power. They don't represent that specific uh, uh, sentence. And so we, you apply what's known as a, a TF-IDF algorithm, which basically, okay, here the representation is, diff is a little bit different. It's, again, very difficult to see here. But basically, we are waiting, uh, waiting, you know the K, okay, waiting, the, um, the word count with what's known as a um, invert, inverse document frequency. So basically, um, we penalize words which are very frequent over all the paragraphs. And we are applying the same algorithm to our question. So what is the secret identity of Batman? And as you can see, the most representative word for this kind of question is a secret, which is getting a higher score with respect to Batman. Because Batman, OK, it's representative in this question, but is very frequent over all the paragraphs. And by doing this uh, and, uh, apply and using uh, a similarity metric, which is the cosine similarity in this case, uh, we compare the vector representation of this uh, question with, all, with the one of all the paragraphs and looking at the, at the, at the two vectors which have the, the smaller cosine, so the highest cosine similarity, we understand which is the paragraph which is closer to this question, so the one which is most likely to contain our answer. And this is the outcome, basically. So here are the scores uh, of the top paragraphs. And the second one is uh, we, are, we are feeding to BERT the first uh, three paragraphs. And the second one is the one which contains the answer we were looking for. So this is basically a um, yeah, very simple, scaled down uh, um, example of how the project I'm working on will work. And um, just wanted to, 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 some, to end up saying that generally, as you, as you saw, it's not working only on chatbots, but also on, on, uh, on uh, speech recognition, more data science and data analysis projects. Uh, uh, they are trying to start a collaboration with the University of Padua regarding human sensing. So there's a really uh, wide variety of projects they're working on. And for, for my experience, the um, the theoretical background uh, I, I got during the master's degree was extremely uh, beneficial in order to like, get up to speed in a reasonable amount of time on topics I, I, I never saw before during, during the master's degree. And one thing that I really appreciated, I mean, this is a, probably a personal thing, uh, but I really appreciated the practical side also of, of the master's degree. A lot of courses have both uh, uh, like give a theoretical background, and then you have either group projects or, 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 or personal projects where you can collaborate also from, with people from different cultures, which is a very an enriching experience for me. And uh, this is not useful only to um, learn the frameworks that you will work on when you go to a working environment. But you also like create projects that you are able to talk to during interviews, which was uh, uh, extremely helpful for me. I personally, I documented everything like in my GitHub account, and this is public, and people had the opportunity to look at it, and uh, 
it was a reason why I, I was chosen in the first case. And so, um, I mean, there are different aspects of this master's degree which are really different, I think, from, from, other, from other courses, and I personally appreciated it. Um, okay, I'm done, and of course, if you have questions regarding uh, the internship from a student point of view of, or questions regarding the master's the master degree, that was Andrea, I think that would be helpful, and, uh, and I will, if you want to reach out to me afterwards, I'd be glad to, uh, to help you. Uh, and of course, to, to Michele as well. Uh, Thanks. Our student, uh, Andrea Sipka, she's a second year student, and uh, she's going to give a, a more, a broader view from the student side of the program, and I think this is going to be extremely helpful for all interested uh, applicants to this program. Uh, I will try and be quick, because it's Monday <laughs> afternoon. Um, hello, I'm Andrea, I'm in the second year, and what uh, the professor asked me to maybe talk a little bit, give you some idea of, you know, if you come, if you choose to come here, um, how kind of your journey throughout this master's will look like. And I thought about my own one, and uh, kind of outlined some areas, and essentially, you are currently somewhere there before data science, and I am attempting to be in the real world right now, uh, or at least <laughs> getting there, and I would like to maybe tell you about everything that happened maybe in a, in a meanwhile to me, but also a little bit also from the perspective of my colleagues, uh, my friends that I've talked about. So, um, before data science, at least for my class, I'm part of the first class of data science, uh, most people have come to the degree straight from a triennale, so straight from the bachelor's. A few people have also tried, uh, started doing a different uh, master's degree and then changed. Uh, there are people who have actually have another master's degree and decided to come and specialize in a different field now. Um, majority of students do come from University of Padova. Uh, but that's not, of course, the case with all of us. Uh, we have people from different continents, from the US universities, from universities in Africa. Um, and the degrees that are taken are very broad. And this is something that I found very helpful, actually, because I got an opportunity to work with people who have very, very different backgrounds and very different uh, points of view on a similar topics. And because we do have a lot of group projects and a lot of practical work that we do as part of our degree, which I will tell you more about later, this was super helpful because we could have teams that are created from people with different expertise. So, you know, I loved working with Nick and Martina, who are a mathematician and a statistician, and their different perspective on, on life as opposed to mine has really helped us to learn from each other as well as learn from the actual task in hand. Um, so some other people have uh, chose to do some work after their bachelor's degree and then have come back. Uh, so I'm one of them. My personal journey was um, going to, I studied uh, uh, for a degree in maths with computer science at Southampton in the UK and then spent five years at IBM as a software engineer and then I heard that wine is far better in Italy and decided to, to come, and, come and do this. So the first part, uh, you know, uh, when I started was building the foundations. This is something that has mostly happened in the first semester of the first year. And um, the foundations are uh, theoretical in a certain sense as well as the practical ones. Uh, for the theoretical part, it really involved uh, bringing students up to speed because of, you have a very <laughs> broad range of people coming from different sorts of uh, degrees, different universities, and you kind of got to make sure that everybody has that kind of basis that will enable you to, to teach them <laughs> to understand, uh, understand topics that are important to data scientists. So the theoretical background that we've covered was, uh, you know, in probability statistics and algorithms, for example, the also basics of programming in Python, uh, basis of uh, computer networks, for example. Um, and, you know, some things were easier for me and then some things were harder for me. And, but I do believe that with, with any of these subjects, it wasn't 
impossible to get there eventually. Like I still have some outstanding exams to do, so maybe, uh, maybe I've just lied to you. Um, but of course, uh, you know, for me, the statistical part was a little bit more difficult because I have avoided mostly statistics before coming here. Um, so I needed to do extra work to catch up. Uh, then maybe for my colleagues from statistics, uh, some more computational things were more difficult, but it's, it's good because um, the, the first semester is really there to, to give you enough uh, to understand everything that comes afterwards. And then in regards to tools uh, that you obtain a basis on, um, we um, have uh, done programming in both R and Python. Um, there are obligatory courses in both of these, so R is covered as part of the statistical learning, and then there is an actual uh, programming course in Python. And, um, but throughout the degree, when we were doing practical projects, people were not professors. I mean, we're not necessarily asking us, giving us a requirement that you have to use this tool, or you have to use this tool, or this language. It was mostly left to us to actually choose what is the best way to deliver the project that we were, that we were working on, which was pretty cool because it allowed us to, to mix and match. So it wasn't just the programming languages, but also the tools that are used in, a, in, a, in general in data science environment. Um, I think most of us are really focused on Python because Python is, uh, it is the most widely used um, uh, programming language for data science because it has a lot of different uh, tools and easy to use libraries which are open source and free and you can kind of quite easily get going with plenty of information on the internet on how to use it. So, we have, um, uh, in, in, in the first semester, obtained uh, um, enough knowledge on, on kind of the two main packages that are used for, for data scientists in Python, which are NumPy and Pandas. And also we have covered different machine learning framework, frameworks, which were, which were then helpful for the projects afterwards. So having obtained, oh, sorry, some, um, some foundations, uh, we have also deepened that knowledge. Uh, both through obligatory courses. So we all had to do mathematical optimization, optimization for data science, uh, machine learning as part of the algorithms and machine learning, and as well as statistical learning where you would, for example, we've covered uh, topics such as dimensionality reduction or some of the machine learning uh, tools that are used. But also there, there is an opportunity that if you want to um, go deeper in some of the kind of theoretical fields, you can choose a more theoretical subject to do as part of your uh, optional courses. Um, for example, um, quite a few of my colleagues chose to do mathematical modeling for, for big data and it was a big hit for them. Um, and some people did, of course, network science or game theory, which were part of, um, part of the day uh, department here. Um, and for example, what I really enjoyed is uh, having an opportunity to take a, a slightly different course, which is looking at uh, uh, technological law and how uh, machine learning um, is, uh, is changing the landscape in, in legislation, for example, which was the course that was, that was done for us. Although I do think that the biggest advantage, like my, my favorite part personally about doing this degree was an opportunity to apply the knowledge that I've obtained, which some of it happened already in the first semester of first year. So for example, um, some of the social science applications we have done is uh, fake news detection that was a part of cognitive and behavioral um, data um, of, of first semester of first year where people, that was actually the current generation were doing that. They were creating classifiers, uh, they, were, they were training on, 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 on a data set of fake news to, to be able to distinguish between what is a fake news and what is not. Or in my year, we were uh, creating a system to detect lying from video so taking a raw video where there is a, uh, for example, a police interview, asking a person questions like basically like basic question like you do in polygraph and then questions that are to do with something else like where were you last Thursday? Um, we were creating a system that, um, that detects, uh, detects lying in video or tries to detect lying in video based on certain physiological tells like for example how often you blink or if you can catch, capture emotion, like if you can use uh, um, different tools and machine learning to capture emotion on our faces. Um, Martina did a really cool project um, in network science where she was analyzing voting patterns in EU Parliament before and after Brexit. So she was studying how, how the legislators have changed their opinions and their ways of voting um, after the Brexit referendum. 
Or, for example, in uh, business, economic, and financial data, we have done a project on uh, adjusting for cultural differences in survey responses. So when you collect a lot of uh, survey data, um, I would have a different, um, different feeling on a certain subject. So, for example, if you were to ask me, you know, are you satisfied with, my, with your life, what is satisfied with life for me might be very different to what is satisfied with, with life for you. And we were studying what are the, some of the tools and practices that you can use to adjust for these uh, cultural individual differences uh, in, in data sets of, um, for example, customer satisfaction. So in regards to natural science, because uh, biology, uh, you know, th this is, uh, uh, Faculty of Biology is one of the, one of the five faculties that are take par taking part in this uh, master's degree. Um, there is quite a lot of opportunity to do um, applications of data science in, to biology or bio, biomedicine. Um, and actually, that kind of context of biological data is one of the most uh, exciting ones for data science in general because they have huge amounts of all sorts of stuff to, to do and they really need data scientists. So if you're interested in bioinformatics, this is probably a very, very good place to start. So an example of things that we were, that we were, that we were studying were part of our biological data course, um, for example, working with DNA data, how to, take a, how to align genome sequences or how to study genome sequences, um, different algorithms for the alignments um, or, uh, and similar, or even a bigger project that we have done was a pro modeling of proteins and their characterization in a very automatic way. So you give me like a one protein and their names, and I have a system that finds that protein in some database, fetches everything about that protein from a second one, finds a similar one, so try to do some clustering, try to do some this, try to do some extraction from, from web pages, try to do some machine learning on it to then create a model of it to then find proteins which are similar to it. So using different sort of um, data sources and different sort of techniques for one very practical problem. Or, for example, some of the engineering applications that we have covered. Um, for example, me and Nick uh, did a project on uh, low footprint keyword recognition, which is a problem which is um, um, very useful for, for example, uh, home devices that uh, Professor Conti was mentioning earlier. Um, so an ability to understand what the user says, and it's a, it's a uh, or, or something, for example, in your, in your, in your smartwatches. Um, for the same uh, uh, subject, uh, which was human data analytics, Yari did a really cool project about detection of activity type in real time, like from his uh, mobile phone data, gyroscope. There is a really cool video. I wish he showed you that. Um, or, for example, using combining different cognitive services for object recognition, which, is a, uh, which was part of the cognitive services course that is run, actually, with the computer science. And, a cool thing about this is that um, for any of the applied courses that, that you kind of get a free choice on, there is a lot of opportunity to do courses in different faculties. Um, for example, my personal interest is, is human behavior and human decision making, so I had an opportunity to take, uh, uh, um, to take uh, decision science stuff from, from psychology and, and learn something there. Right, so finally, the uh, professor mentioned that uh, the last uh, semester of the, of, the, of the master's is uh, related to the internship, uh, so that's my real world part. That's where kind of I am currently, uh, but I was also hoping to maybe tell you for where my colleagues are, so this is my generation and my friends, where they are at the moment and what kind of stuff they are doing, because that might give you an idea of you know, having spent a year and a half here, what kind of stuff you can work on uh, for your thesis. So we have three people in Max Planck in Tübingen. I think they essentially completely speak Italian now in Tübingen. Uh, Nick is working on, uh, he's developing new sampling algorithms for centrality measures of sample networks. Nick is a mathematician and, you know, it's his, his choices are, <laughs> are aligned. And for example, Martina is doing community de detection in a complex real networks. So I think it's an extension of her, of her interest that she, she found in a network science course that she took here. Um, I am currently in Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Trento. I will tell you more about what I'm doing later. Um, Matteo spent summer in CERN in Geneva, and he was building a machine learning pipelines for the analysis of the huge data sets of 
of high energy physics data that they have there. Um, he was implementing different uh, technologies and tools and different algorithms to create um, essentially helper tools for, for the researchers there uh, to make sense of their data using, using data science techniques. Um, Brian, who is interested in biology and bioinformatics, is in Helmholtz in Leipzig, where he is using machine learning to uh, improve efficiency of protein experiments, to be able to tell uh, when the, uh, a certain experiment is going to finish or um, how long. Uh, 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 the, huh. Uh, what is the, uh, <laughs> um, when he, um, I think it's very biological and I cannot repeat it, I'm sorry. Um, and finally, uh, we also had uh, quite a few projects offered from a high school of economics in Moscow. So these are kind of the theoretical people who took, and then as you saw, um, we had people, we have uh, Yari in general in Paris, we have um, uh, people in Vodafone in Milan or in, also in consulting companies. Um, and finally, I would like to tell you just a bit about what I am doing. Um, I am assuming that kind of all of you have Facebook, although probably it stopped being cool some years ago. And uh, that is um, possibly a trend that is, that is the case for, for this geography and, this, um, and, and our age group. Um, but for a lot of the world, Facebook is far more than just memes or uh, cat pictures or your annoying aunt. Uh, but it is actually, in, in certain places of the world, it is what they consider the internet. It's where they get everything. They get where they get their information, where they are in touch with everybody. And uh, for this reason, um, like I'm quite interested in studying Facebook and that was a main motivation for me leaving the world of, world of software engineering, coming back and studying some more. Um, there is a cool institute in, at Oxford University called Oxford Internet Institute and they have a project called Computational Propaganda Project where they study the use of uh, social media in, in political context and they publish, um, every year they publish a report about uh, what has been happening and in 2018 they said that you know, they, they have found an evidence of formally organized social media manipulation campaigns in 48 countries uh, up from 28 in last year, so 2017 to 2018, 20 more countries started doing this, started using social media to manipulate public opinion, not necessarily spreading fake news, sometimes it's spreading true news or sort of, you know, trying to change the minds of others. And this is not always uh, in a context of the political election, it can be in a military context. And there's always it's something that st usually starts from Americans doing it to a small country somewhere, then Russians start doing it to the Americans, then Americans start doing it to somebody else, and suddenly everybody gets involved in the process. Um, so since 2010, they have estimated that the political parties and governments have spent more than half a billion dollars on psychological operations and public opinion manipulation over social media. Now, to do this, of course, you need to have uh, possibly some skill in regards to, um, to, to, to how to craft your message, but you also ha need to have this key thing, which is an understanding of the user. You need to understand who it is that uses it in, on a very kind of micro scale, like a personal, like you or you or you or me, who we are, what is our way of thinking, what is our way of making decisions, what is our personality, and then based on that, craft the message in such a way that that message resonates with us. So, a lot of research was done very successfully and then used in a political context, so for example, the latest uh, presidential election in the US or you know, a certain referendum on the European Union in the UK, um, where people have found that a relatively small number of Facebook likes, and here I don't mean liking your friend's status, I mean liking a page, like my favorite page on Facebook before I deleted it, and I deleted it now that I've, <laughs> I've done this research, um, is, uh, was Italians mad at food, which is usually just people being upset about cream in carbonara. But based on a relatively small number of likes, you can create a very relatively simple classifier which can tell you a personality of the user. And it can tell you a personality of a user better than, for example, 
wait, can I? Does this? Yes. So a work colleague is here, and then a friend or cohabitant is here. And the higher it is, the better the accuracy is, so you're better. Computer, the, the classifier, is here. And only slightly higher is your husband or wife. And the classifier kind of knows you better than your family does. And a lot of work was done on, on likes and personality, likes and decision making, um, likes and opinions, for example. And also, it has extended past this to some other aspects of a so social network. So for my research, I have been lucky enough to obtain a very cool data set, which was collected by, at Cambridge University. Um, and it's very similar to the data set that was used later to start uh, research at Cambridge Analytica, which you may have heard about. And my data set is, uh, contains um, a Facebook data of just over 7,000 subjects. They're all Americans. And they have all donated their Facebook statuses and their Facebook likes. So everything they've ever written as a status on Facebook, I have that. Um, and also they have filled out some surveys which, uh, in which way we have captured the demographic information about them. So like what is their gender, how old they are, um, what do they do, like what is the level of education, but also some psychometric measures. And in this, this is a uh, big five, which, was, uh, um, which is a psychological measure that is often used to describe somebody's personality on a, on a five-dimensional scale, but also satisfaction with life, which is, what I'm, uh, which, which is what I'm focusing on. I'm trying to actually capture ca happiness from my data, or um, a satisfaction with work, how passionate somebody is with, about their work in both obsessive and a harmonious way. So, because people have done uh, a lot of research on likes, I thought, oh, you know, it would be really cool uh, to do something new and do research on language. Also because natural language processes, processing is actually something that's kind of missing from this degree. We haven't really covered it much as part of the degree, and I wanted to, to gain understanding also on how to do this. And the stage is supposed to be an educational opportunity as well as an opportunity for you to get some experience and, uh, and write a thesis. So I'm currently working only with, uh, with Facebook statuses uh, on which I'm doing natural language processing. And I want to maybe just give you a, a few ideas on how that would be done. So this is an example of a Facebook state. Like I couldn't write, use an actual one because my data is very private. But say, you know, this is a very generic sort of basic person writes something stupid on Facebook. And so I, as a researcher, could look at this and try to figure out, OK, uh, what is it that is relevant for my data given what my question is? So if I'm trying to maybe like capture a personality or a happiness of a person, um, I could say, well, okay, this person uses slang. Like bestest day is not really a proper way to do it and slang detection is something that's possible to do and people have done it before and you know, I can use some tools to detect maybe slang and figure out what is the percentage of the words that the person uses that are slang words. I can also capture, for example, repeated punctuation. Because if I'm trying to capture neuroticism of a person, somebody that like, comes in and like, types in 700 exclamation points could be an indicator to this. Or whether a person uses emoji. Or if a person shares links. So these are all an exa really examples of features that I can extract from a particular piece of text. In this case, a Facebook status. So other feature that you could be using are like, so these were all examples of a, what I call a DIY features because I chose them myself. I chose them myself based on literature that I have read, for example, thinking, okay, so what are the indications about the way somebody speaks or somebody expresses themselves that could tell me something about how happy they are, how satisfied they are, or what their personality is. Um, but you can also have some intuition that is your own. So for example, the emoji stuff, like I thought, do you know what? Somebody that uses emojis, like I think that maybe that could be an indicator. So I extract that, you just try different things. Um, there are also, so I, some of the features that I'm using are those. So I'm also working on some ready-made feature extractions. For example, there are psychological, um, programs that have been developed to help people analyze the language. So you could use those. 
And you could also, what, what I'm doing is I'm doing some sentiment analysis, so trying to capture um, the, uh, the positivity or the subjectivity of a of, of, of person's way of expressing themselves and trying to compare them, how that changes over time, and then maybe figure out if this is one of the good indicators um, for what I'm trying to explain. Or also I could use something very, uh, and I am using something very kind of mathematical, technical, where you're using an approach that analyzes the frequency of a particular word or um, even the type of the word that, that is being used. So having extracted features and done some pre-processing of the data, which is something that well, I have actually learned <laughs> as part of this degree, um, I am uh, doing a machine learning on it. So I have, because m my data is labeled, so this is a supervised machine learning task for which I'm focusing on using three different types of algorithms. Um, so I'm using random forest, I'm using logistics regression, I'm using gradient boost, so XG boost. And big part of my motivations of what I'm using is not necessarily, hey, um, this is what works best, this is how I get the highest accuracy or highest F1 score and whatever is the way that I am, um, that I am um, evaluating my programs, but also, hey, can I get an explainable result from this? So can I have an algorithm, can I use an algorithm which is not completely black box, which can allow me to understand what features was how much important in this task that I was doing. So maybe if I come up with, the, with, the, with a, um, a classifier uh, that is of a certain um, accuracy and it tells me for your result, what was the most important thing was if a person uses emojis and also how much uh, religious words they were using in their text. That is something that can motivate uh, further research on the topic, and it's, uh, it's, it's my preferred way of, of doing what I'm doing. So, in all honesty, it's not going great. <laughs> um, I, don't, I'm, I don't have great results. Like, they are, they, they, I have some results, but I don't have great results. Um, I have, however, learned something about a, a, an application area, which, was very, um, which is very different to what I've done as part of the degree to start with. And uh, I think maybe it's a representative of how science in general works and how research works. And my big motivation for doing a, an internship in a research center was to see how, how I get along with research because I was considering doing a PhD. I'm reconsidering that now, <laughs> having spent this time. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of roughly uh, what I've been doing and what I'm currently doing also. I am um, I'm at, a, at a lab in FBK called Mobile and Social Computing Lab. Um, and that is it, roughly. I don't really think uh, um, I have anything else to say, um, but uh, I, you know, there's not much point of asking you for questions now, uh, but please, uh, if you are interested or if you have questions or if you want me to gossip about who are the difficult professors, uh, send me an email. Like, I'm, I would be more than, more than happy to respond, or if you have uh, concerns maybe about prerequisite knowledge that you have or whether something is right. Like, you know, I'm, I can't give perfect advice. I can't promise that, but I, will, I promise that I will try. All right, thank you. I really want to thank deeply all the speakers uh, and uh, all of you who participated to this, uh, to this presentation, to this open day. And now uh, our guests are still here and uh, I would say that the best uh, way of asking question is to ask question individually and so we are here and you can just exploit us and uh, so we conclude here and let me just thank again uh, all the speakers uh, of today <laughs>